In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let's take a moment to recollect ourselves in the presence of God and invite the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. Saint Jerome, pray for us. Saint Matthew, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 14 of Matthew's Gospel. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. And he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him, and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod, so that he promised with an oath, to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a lonely place apart. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. As he went ashore, he saw a great throng, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a lonely place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Then he made the disciples get into the boat and go, to, go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was many furlongs distant from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately he spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, have no fear. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, bid me come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, O oh, man of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. And when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, 
they sent round through all that region and brought to him all that were sick and besought him that they that they might only touch the fringe of his garment and as many as touched it were made well the gospel of the lord all right folks so what we have here is kind of a narrative flashback and what's interesting is that uh, Herod and the others were thinking Jesus was John the Baptist. I mean, that, that's kind of curious to me. I mean, in, here in chapter 14, it says Herod thought that, uh, you know, maybe this was John the Baptist coming back to haunt him or something, risen from the dead. Um, but in chapter 16, when our Lord says, who do the people say that I am to his disciples? And they say, well, some say St. John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he famously says, well, who do you say that I am? Uh, but so um, I just find this interesting. This poor guy is so conflicted and tormented. He thinks maybe this is St. John the Baptist. Uh, but what's odd about that is uh, he says, uh, that is why these powers, mighty powers are at work in him. All right. Um, Mighty works uh, are at work in him because because he's St. John the Baptist. St. John the Baptist didn't really, there's no record of him performing any miracles. So uh, St. Thomas Aquinas kind of deals with this in an interesting way. He says this demonstrates a positive quality in his belief in a resurrection. In other words, Herod believes that John, who he had killed, uh, came back to life in a resurrected body and with resurrection comes a greater emergence of power um this is what saint thomas aquinas actually says something positive that guy is so fair and balanced he actually tries to find something positive in herod antipas and says see there's a thread of there's a ray of light in that man's mind he actually believes in the resurrection, uh, St. Thomas surmises from this and uh, that there's something greater, you know, a greater power emerges. Uh, like St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 43, what is sown in weakness is raised in power. Okay, um, St. John the Baptist never performed miracles, but this guy's performing them. Hey, maybe this... Maybe that's why these powers are working him. St. John the Baptist, risen from the dead. Anyway, very interesting uh, argument Aquinas makes. And then Luke adds to the story that, you know, he sought to see him. He wants to see Jesus. Um, hmm. All right. Now, there's uh, a high cost of discipleship, folks. We see that very clearly here. Our Lord's been telling us that back in the Beatitudes. Remember, at the end of the Beatitudes, he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Okay, for the kingdom of God is theirs. All right, we're going to be persecuted. Uh, he's very clear about that also in the missionary discourse in chapter 10. He says, you know, he who would save his life must lose it. Uh, that we're going to be persecuted. Uh, is something our Lord's been saying, and now here we see it happening, and this is very sobering. This is a very sobering moment for our Lord and for all the apostles. Um, and, I mean, man, uh, shaken up. Uh, this thing is real, and this is serious, deadly serious. This guy got his head chopped off. A colleague of our Lord, his very cousin, had his head chopped off by Herod Antipas. Uh-oh, man. The apostles are counting the cost, you know, of their following him. They're fearful they're going to get killed too, okay? Uh, they have to be thinking about that now more than ever. Uh, so very sobering um, when this happens, I'm sure of it. And it points towards Jesus' own passion and the later passion or execution death of so many of the apostles and members of the early church. Uh, there are going to be many who are martyred. We hear about them in Revelation 20, uh, verse 4. Um, so Herod is a tetrarch. What the heck is a tetrarch? It's a leader of a fourth. Must have been a common uh, way of Roman governance to divide a region up into four parts. Uh, but uh, uh, tetrarchy is a fourth 
so he's a ruler of a fourth. In common address, he was referred to as King Herod Antipas, uh, but he actually never received that title king, and he kind of resented that. Uh, he wanted that title. He was a very ambitious uh, individual, and he craved that title, but never officially received it. Uh, so anyway, we got to get all these Herods straight. It, it, I don't know as I have them all straight because there's a bunch of outliers. I just, uh, I'm going to do my best to do a little, a little, try to paint a little picture of what's going on here. We got Herod the Great, who was king at the time of our Lord. When he was born and came into this world, he famously ordered the execution of those innocents in Bethlehem. All right. uh, that's Jesus is, um, you know, uh, Herod Antipas' father. Okay, is Herod the Great, who had six sons, and two of them, Herod the Great had executed, all right, and he killed some of his wives uh, as well, and many other people he had put to death. Uh, yeah, Caesar Augustus famously quipped that it's safer to be Herod the Great's pig than to be his son. Uh, wow, that's messed up. So he had this reputation around the Roman Empire of, um, yeah, he was no one to be trifled with. Now, Herod the Great had these six sons, two of them he had killed, so he passed the kingdom off to his four sons. Uh, he was succe succeeded by Archelaus. Remember, because Matthew mentions him in the return from Egypt, and when he's looking at maybe settling in Judea, he does an end run and goes up to Galilee, to Nazareth, because he was afraid to go there. Why? Because Archelaus was ruler there, who uh, he wasn't liked very much by the Jews. And they complained about him in Rome. And uh, so Herod, or excuse me, uh, the Caesar, that's when he said, all right, this guy Archelaus ain't cutting it. And he's going to cause a rebellion. Uh, so he said, all right, we're going to divide the kingdom up into four parts, four tetrarchies. And he gives Archelaus two of them. Then he gives Herod Antipas. He gives Galilee. And then he gives the region of the Perea, this land of Perea, which is like the Transjordan on the eastern side of the Jordan River, uh, kind of along there, what is in modern day Jordan, some of it. Um, and he gives him this stretch of land over there as well. So he's got Galilee and Perea. And <clears throat> Antipas uh, means like the father, so before we get too harshly critical of Herod Antipas, uh, <clears throat> you know, we ought to realize he had a pretty rough upbringing by uh, Herod the Great. And, <clears throat> you know, he's a chip off the old block. He's like the father. So there but for the grace of God go I, St. Francis of Sisi might say. Uh, to whom more has been given, much will be required. Uh, this guy, we haven't worn his moccasins, you know, before we're too quick to judge or harsh on him. Let's recognize, hey, maybe if we grew up in his household with that father, uh, we might be like the father too. We might be worse than Herod Antipas was. Okay, so look, everybody knew this guy. He reigned from four A.D. to A.D. 39. So that's 35 years. This guy reigned for ne nearly the entirety of the life of Jesus. This guy was in power. And, you know, he's extremely well known by everybody. All right. So, yeah, um, his character, his personality, his temperament, his mannerisms, all of it. Everybody knows him. Uh, Herod Antipas. And our Lord interestingly calls him a fox. So he was a crafty, maneuvering, slippery politician. Uh, and Herod the fox, to have the Son of God call you a fox? Wow. You tell that fox, he says uh, in Luke's gospel. But, but anyway, um, now he has this uh, half-brother, Philip, um, who's also Herod the great son by a different mother. Who's still alive. And they're both in Philip and Herod Antipas are in Rome at the same time. You know, they were all educated in Rome. 
a lot of back and forth between Rome and Palestine. Isn't that interesting? Between these rulers. Uh, yeah, they were very Roman. Roman trained. Archelaus, Philip, and Herod Antipas, Herod the Great's sons who took power after Herod the Great died, they were all educated in Rome. I didn't know that, and I find that really interesting. Okay, so, uh, yeah, they have close ties to the Romans, for sure. And they were formed and crafted and shaped, you know, by the Romans uh, to do this job. Uh, but while uh, on one of these trips, Herod Antipas is in Rome. And guess who happens to be there but Philip and his wife, Herodias. And they fall in love. Herod Antipas falls in love with Herodias. And uh, she seduces him or whatever the heck. She must not have been in a very happy marriage with Philip. So anyway, uh, they uh, hook up. And in Leviticus, it says you can't do that. Leviticus 18 and 20 is very interesting. It says you can't, you can't uncover your brother's nakedness. This is a Hebraic expression. Very interesting in light of Ham. Okay, remember back in Genesis, uh, the uncovering of his father's nakedness okay uh, i'm not going to go into that but anyway this is a hebraic expression here it says you shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife she is your brother's nakedness all right um and in chapter 20 it says uh, if a man takes his brother's wife it is impurity he has uncovered his brother's nakedness and they shall be childless now, I'm not aware of them having any children. Um, um, yeah, I don't remember reading about any children they had. Uh, also, we want to look at uh, Deuteronomy 25. So Deuteronomy 25 just tells us that, uh, you know, it's the right and duty of a, of a brother when his brother dies to marry his widow, okay, and to... Uh, perform this duty of raising up a child and then naming it after his dead brother. Uh, but in this case, the brother's still alive. And this is impurity, it says in Leviticus, for him to be doing this. So when he says it's unlawful, St. John the Baptist, uh, he's right. He's spot on in saying that. Uh, but what Herodias and Herod Antipas of Don have, uh, they've suppressed the voice of conscience. That is a scary thing, that we can suppress the voice of conscience. Because you got the life of faith and morals, and they're interconnected, and they affect each other. And usually we think, uh-oh, if you lose your faith, you know, you might lose your morals. Uh, our faith upholds our morals, okay, um, and supports our moral life when we have strong faith. It helps support that moral life. But the opposite is true, too. You can have strong faith, but if your moral life suffers, in other words, if you suppress the voice of conscience or reject conscience, uh, it can actually undermine your faith. So the two are integrally bound up with each other. It's a theme I like to think about and preach on. St. Paul nails this in 1 Timothy 1.19. Holding faith and a good conscience. Faith and a good conscience. An upright conscience. Um, by rejecting conscience, okay, by rejecting or suppressing conscience, Certain persons have made shipwreck of their faith. Okay? Uh, so interesting. We can lose our faith uh, if we suppress the voice of conscience. If we're not continuously repentant. Okay? Turning back to the Lord. Of course we're all going to sin. Uh, but when we stop listening to the voice of conscience and we allow sin to give way in our heart, we have a lax or reprobate conscience in some particular area. we got to stay in the fight. That's having a good conscience. We don't stop listening to it. Uh, it's going to torment us because the 
catechism says you can never completely uh, uh, remove the voice of conscience. You can't entirely suppress it. You can't eradicate the moral sense. Even if you're a psychopath, I don't think you can. On some level, you're still going to be tickled in the back of your mind uh, by the moral conscience. It's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to entirely remove it from our hearts. But uh, So it looks like what Herod and Herodias have done here, you know, is uh, in doing this, they are going to, they're in danger of making a shipwreck of whatever faith they have uh, by doing this. Now, uh, John was in prison for 10 months. It's a long time. Just to get the facts nice and clear. And where is he, BTW? He's in Machaerus, okay? More than likely. That's what Josephus, this Jewish historian of the first century, tells us. Uh, so that's what we can imagine. That's part of that region of Perea. It's now modern-day Jordan, but it's on the eastern side of the Jordan River and actually on the other side of the Dead Sea. Jordan flows into the Dead Sea. On the other side of the Dead Sea, I think we talked about this uh, before. So, And I showed you some pictures of it, uh, the ruins that exist there. I I'm just going to get a fizzy water. Hang on. So, uh, so that's where he is for 10 months. That's a long time. You know, well, we might not realize it was that long, but that's a long time. Now, I like the portrayal. Uh, if you've seen Jesus of Nazareth, uh, it's just so good. So, so good. If you haven't seen it in a while, you got to go back and watch it. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth, classic. And I believe it's Christopher Plummer, you know, the Sound of Music guy. Uh, who also is in that great movie with Gregory Peck, The Scarlet and the Black. He plays that German uh, commander uh, in Rome. Fascinating. He's an excellent actor. He plays Herod the Great masterfully. What a what a masterful actor he is, Christopher Plummer. Jeez. Anyway, um, and he, he really does a good job. He shows how conflicted this guy is. I mean, he's a tormented, tortured soul, uh, this guy. And uh, Mark kind of gets this across a little bit, this, this conflict in a man's soul when he says this. Mark 6.20. Herod feared John, knowing, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man. So he knows that this is a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, so presumably he allowed St. John the Baptist to preach to him sometimes. When he heard him, he was very much perplexed. And yet he heard him gladly. You know, so interesting. You know, that he enjoyed listening to St. John the Baptist and he knew it was perplexed. You see this war, he's perplexed. And um, liked to listen to him. Uh, so he is, uh, an example of a man who is distazo. It's an interesting word. Only Matthew uses it twice. He uses it in the upcoming episode here, uh, in this chapter later when Peter is standing on the water and then he starts to feel the wind and he goes in. He is distazo, according to our Lord. Our Lord says, why did you doubt? Oh, you have a little faith. Why did you doubt? The word doubt is distazo. Okay, it's literally two stances. Man of two stances. And at the end of Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 28, verse 19, all the apostles, you know, they see our Lord ascend into heaven, and then it says that they, uh, they believe, but they also doubted. You know, just kind of like at the crossroads, at the fork in the road, and you're standing there, you don't know which way to go. You haven't fully committed yet. Uh, that's so interesting, that word. And uh, to, to, to not make a decision and just stand there. As uh, Elijah says to the Israelites, you know, he kind of rebukes them on Mount Carmel when he takes on those uh, 400 prophets of Baal. Okay, 1 Kings 18, 
21, he says to them, uh, why do you go limping with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. Okay, make up your mind. Uh, you can't just stand there and claim to be an agnostic. Uh, he who does not gather with me scatters. You can't just stand there and do nothing and think you're just going to stay on the sidelines. You're going to stay out of this. You're not going to choose uh, whom to fight for. Now, um, so he is kind of an example of this uh, Distazo, you know, a man of double stance. And he wanted to kill John, though, we hear in Matthew. This further adds a, le a level of mystery to the whole thing that, you know, Matthew indicates very clearly that he wanted to kill John the Baptist. So part of him wants to put this guy to death and just be done with it. But he fears the people, too, because there might be an uprising because the people think he's a prophet. But then he also hears him gladly, it sounds like. He, he enjoys listening to him. Heard him gladly. And knew he was a righteous and holy man. So really, really pitiful uh, individual he is. Um, he wanted to kill John. And perhaps this was Herod's own ploy. This is my own just, you know, thinking like, a guy who's really foxy, you know, a fox, uh, could come up with some political way, uh, just my own wild speculation, that maybe this whole thing was just a big charade with uh, Herodias and his daughter uh, performing this dance to put Herod in a position where he could have an excuse to put this guy to death that Matthew already told us he wanted to kill. All right. Uh, so maybe it's reached ahead and he engineered or he conceived this whole plan himself and made it appear like it was Herodias. Uh, but it was actually him uh, engineering and orchestrating this whole thing. Uh, and then it was a, all for show. I think we can't underestimate the craftiness of this guy uh, that maybe this whole thing was a ploy. Uh, especially, it just seems unlikely to me, the exaggeration here, that she performs a dance. And this guy who's so hungry for power and so ambitious, that he promises her half his kingdom? Really? All right? Uh, up to half of my kingdom when she pleases him and his guests. Um, really, just for performing a dance, you're going to offer her half your dang kingdom uh that makes me wonder like he's trying to posture himself before his guests to let them see how just how magnanimous and generous he is to his daughter he's going to offer her half his kingdom but my hunch is he never meant to offer her that he was never going to give her that uh she was already instructed this whole thing was engineered by him that's what I'm wondering sometimes, just how sneaky this guy might have been. Uh, that uh, Because, yeah, that just seems so far-fetched that he would offer her half his kingdom. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's a birthday party, probably at Macaris, this fortress, okay. And it's a birthday party. Uh, the Jews... They don't make a big deal about birthday parties. They kind of look down on it as kind of a pagan practice. It was big in Egypt. It's big in Persia. Okay. And the only other birthday party we really hear about is the birthday of Pharaoh in chapter 40 of Genesis. Okay. It's the last time we heard about a birthday party. Okay. So, yeah, that's not somebody you want to be set alongside. Herod Antipas is having a birthday party here. So the Jews weren't real fond of, uh, I can, you can just imagine the rabbis kind of sneering at this, making this big deal over your birthday. Um, so anyway, you don't hear much about birthdays in the Old Testament. The only thing I found is uh, in Job chapter 1, uh, his seven sons and three daughters would have banquets at each other's houses on their day. And it's kind of unclear what that day means. But it could be, some people translate it as on their birthdays. Not quite sure.
might be. Um, and then they're all killed. That's so ironic. If that is the case, that it was their birthday, that they gather for these banquets, and then they're all put to death, which calls to mind Ecclesiastes, which kind of is a downer in some ways. And, uh, and it... Uh, but, you know, it does represent something of the cynical and you know, Jewish mindset here about your birthday. Uh, Solomon uh, says this in Ecclesiastes. Uh, the day of death is better than the day of birth. Chapter 7, verse 1. And it is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all men. And the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. And by sadness of countenance, the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. But the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. You know, so, hey, if the Jews and the rabbis are reading this, you know, and thinking of that, those words of Ecclesiastes that Solomon left for us, uh, yeah, further adds to their scorn of this mirth. You know, the shallow, superficial mirth and feasting and banqueting. Um, so anyway, uh, let's uh, look at Sal uh, Salome is the name of this daughter. We don't hear that in the scriptures themselves. Do not tell us what her name is. We get this again from that Jewish historian, Josephus, tells us what her name is. And interestingly, her name, Salome, uh, derives from the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. So there's more irony uh, in the story here. And because of his oath, he makes an oath, a uh, horkos, all right, before his guests. Uh, and, you know, when you make a, a horkos, okay, an oath in Greek, uh, you, it comes from the word for fence or boundary, okay, ultimately. But uh, you're really hemming yourself in. Why? Because you're bringing God into the equation. When you swear, it's more than just a promise. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, he promised, but then he also added to it an oath. And when, you know, you promise, you promise in your own name. A promissorial note is something you sign. Okay, but you know, it's your name behind a promise. But when you swear or make an oath, now you're bringing God's name into it as a witness. God is a witness to that promise. It's elevated to the status of an oath, far superior to a mere promise. All right, so, uh, yeah, he made oaths before his guests, um, and he hemmed himself in, put a fence or boundary up. Uh, but, you know, it's an unjust oath. It's an unjust oath. And one way to remember that, Horkos is a uh, Horkia, ex Horkia. You know, to exercise is to swear the devil out. Exorcist. That's what an exorcist is. Okay. Um, yeah. So anyway, to bring God's power, God's name uh, is, um, is what an exorcism is. To bring the power and name of God uh, to the devil. To swear him out uh, with the power of God. Ex horkia. Now, um, so he makes these oaths, bringing God into it. And I like uh, how St. Thomas Aquinas cites Jeremiah 4, verses 1 and 2, uh, who says, If you return, O Israel, says the Lord to me, you should return. If you remove from your abominations, if you remove your abominations from my presence and do not waver, and if you swear as the Lord lives in truth, in justice, and in uprightness, then nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. As long as you're swearing in truth, in justice, and in uprightness. Okay. Um, hmm. Well, that's not the kind of oaths he's making to this dancing girl before his guests. This is not truthful, just, or righteous by any means. Therefore, he is not bound by this oath um, because it's an unjust uh, oath entirely 
unrighteous oath. Uh, there's no way uh, that he can use that as an excuse here that uh, because of his oaths before his guests, he just, what's driving him is fear of man, fear of what others think of him. In Zechariah uh, chapter 8, verse 17 also says, do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. And love no false oath for all these things I hate, says the Lord. This is a false oath that he's made before his guests. And St. Thomas Aquinas calls him out on it. I like that. Now, uh, where am I? The king was sorry, Matthew says. But Mark intensifies that, saying that he was exceedingly sorry. Now, we, you know, we're, we're, we're grieved uh, sometimes, but it's not always a godly grief. There's a distinction to be made here that St. Paul makes very well in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Godly grief and worldly grief. He distinguishes between these two things. And uh, it's really worth looking at really quick here. Uh, first of all, in 1 Corinthians, St. Paul lambastes the church in Corinth. He blasts them, confronts them, challenges them. Lots of immature thinking and discord and strife and contention in the community and uh, calls them out. Well, you know, they were really shattered, some of them. Uh, some were outraged, maybe, but some were also really devastated by this confrontation of St. Paul. And uh, so then in 2 Corinthians, St. Paul says, you know, I'm glad. I know I made you sorry with my letter, but I don't regret it. Uh, for I see that, this, that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. Um, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret. But worldly grief produces death. So what Herod is, is experiencing here, uh, if he really has any authentic sorrow here, is kind of a worldly grief. All right? And he feels regret but it produces death you know um there's no repentance in his heart here that we can see um so it isn't a godly grief which leads to repentance and salvation and brings no regret but rather it is just mere worldly grief which is based on regret alone there is no repentance there is no salvation and it just brings death, produces death. So it's, yeah, it's kind of, a, uh, yeah, so he's exceedingly sorry. Now, St. Jerome says something different here. He says he may not have been, it, it may not have been because, because he wanted to kill him previously. We already saw that at the beginning of the chapter that he, you know, it's stated explicitly that Herod wanted to kill him. So why is he so sorry now? So, you know, he finally got what he wanted in the first place. To kill this guy. Now he's dead. Uh, well, St. Jerome says uh, it could just be that Matthew's recording what it seemed like uh, to the guests, to the eyewitnesses who were there, that he looked sorry, exceedingly sorry to them. But in fact, you know, he, it may not have... Uh, you know, man sees only according to the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. Maybe it wasn't really uh, some sorrow. Maybe it was all an act. That's what I think. This guy's foxy and crafty. I think this whole thing was orchestrated by him. I think he's making, first he makes out like he's so generous to his daughter. And now he's making this big act because he doesn't want the people to get mad at him. It's my own wild speculation. He doesn't want the people to get mad at him, so he's making this big show of sorrow. Oh, he's so deeply grieved, you know, at her request that he wanted her to make. 
Um, that's my own thought. Maybe all three of them devised this plan, or he and Herodias devised this plan together. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he's trying to give himself a little cover. There's a little CYA, CYA going on here with him. And uh, maybe he just wants them to think that. Um, wants them. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, according to St. Jerome, this is gruesome, okay? But according to St. Jerome, Herodias drove a bodkin. That's like a little dagger, okay? It's really like a hairpin. Uh, used to fix your hair or whatever women would use. She drove it into his tongue. That's messed up. Um, ouch. Uh, yeah. So fear of man in Herod Antipas. He's afraid of what people think of him. He's The man is driven by fear. The poor guy. And uh, Galatians, St. Paul talks about this in Galatians 1.10. says, uh, Am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still pleasing men, I should not be a servant of Christ. You know? So, we can't be men pleasers. Uh, that's kind of what we see in Herod Antipas here. Now, some other little details from Luke you know, Herod wants to kill you. Our Lord is warned by the Pharisees, no less. His very enemies, or at least some of them. Uh, many of them were his enemies. Um, and probably wanted to see him killed. Uh, <laughs> but in one instance, in Luke 13, 31 and 32, uh, it says that Herod, they, the Pharisees came to him and warned him, don't, look, Herod wants to kill you. And our Lord says, you tell that fox, you tell that fox. And then what's interesting too is, uh, our Lord says, behold, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And the third day I finish my course. You know, that's just an interesting expression he makes. When you say on the third day, you can't help but think in Christian terms. The third day being the day you rose from the tomb. On the third day. And I just wonder if our Lord's saying, I'll, I'm going to take this all the way to the end. And on the third day when I finish my course, he's not going to be able to stop my plan. As he goes on to say, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. So our Lord's got a plan, and uh, he's going to accomplish his plan. And when he's ready on the third day, he will finish his course and come out of that tomb. All right. Um, another few interesting details from Luke here. Joanna is one of the, uh, in Luke chapter 8, describes these women who assist our Lord. Uh, <clears throat> a whole bunch of women. And uh, some women. Mary Magdalene, and also Joanna, the wife of Chuza, Herod's steward. Isn't that funny? That uh, one of the women following our Lord was the wife of Herod Antipas's steward. It's just kind of neat. Um, and Herod, with his soldiers, let's just be reminded while we're talking about Luke, that uh, he records some other little interesting details about the during the Passion account, he says that uh, Herod, Herod, with his soldiers, treated him, our Lord, with contempt and mocked him. And then, very interestingly, Herod and Pilate became friends. It's just interesting. It's very interesting, to tell you the truth. Yeah, sorry, I'm just thinking about first excuse me second kings chapter six second kings chapter six elisha the prophet who is a uh, type of our lord he uh reconciles the king of israel and the king of syria um go read chapter six it's an amazing chapter of second kings 
And this prophet, Elisha, oh man, he's incredible. Um, and he also multiplies uh, barley loaves in chapter 4, like our Lord's about to do. We're going to hear in a second here as we get into this miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and fish. So Elisha the prophet is very much a, um, a type of Christ. And he multiplies barley loaves. John tells us that the loaves were actually barley loaves. He gives us that specific detail. And it was yesterday that we, uh, this past weekend, that we heard uh, this very passage in John chapter 6 read. Uh, so Herod and Pilate became friends. I don't know. I'm just, yeah. Um, interesting, interesting, interesting. Now, uh, his first wife, this is a little, let's do a little epilogue here on what happens to Herod Antipas, okay, in the end final analysis what, what, what goes on to happen to that guy well listen to this his first wife uh was you know this nabatean king this this uh petra uh is like south of jerusalem really cool um ancient city in these like cliffs i don't know what to call them uh these ravines really dramatic uh, this like hidden city, uh, this lost city of Petra, you know, was discovered eventually. And it's incredible uh, in this wilderness region, but it was right on the trade route between Egypt and everything up above. So, it, it, you know, it was kind of like a merchant city. A lot of commerce took place there and a lot of goods were exchanged, uh, but they were powerful and they were a warlike people, these Nabataeans, okay? And the king, Aretas, Marries his daughter to Herod Antipas. Isn't that interesting? So that's Herod, Herod's first wife. So not only does he take his brother Philip's wife, Herodias, but he himself, you know, basically um, abandons his first wife. Uh, and her father, she runs away. She runs back to her father because uh, she's afraid that Herod, Herod Antipas, now that she's fallen out of favor and he's fallen in love with this other woman, Herod Antipas is going to have her killed. Um, so anyway, he uh, this King Aretas of the Nabataeans, he when his daughter comes running back and tells him uh, what this Herod Antipas did, he's furious, you know, and he holds a grudge against him. And years later, he's going to get in a border dispute with King Herod Antipas you know, because his kingdom kind of touches, you know, that region. In Macarius along the west eastern side of the Dead Sea. Okay, uh, they're going to get in some little border dispute, but really I think it's about his daughter. King Aretas is going to attack Herod Antipas and uh, deliver a defeat. Okay, he's going to he's going to whip whoop him, uh, Herod Antipas in battle. Uh, very interesting. He gets his revenge uh, on her. On his daughter's husband, first husband there. Um, and then he gets into another dispute. He's mad uh, about King Herod Agrippa, uh, who gets this title of king. You know, he wants that title king. And Rome gives it to this other uh, King Herod Agrippa, uh, who I think is like his nephew. And uh, so anyway... He, uh, Herod Antipas goes to Rome to complain about this and try to, um, you know, negotiate something and, 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 and lobby that he should receive the title king if this King Herod Agrippa is going to get it. How come he doesn't have this title by now, all his loyal service to Rome? Well, some of the followers or uh, servants of King Agrippa follow Herod Antipas to Rome and they secretly present their case to the emperor as well. So when the emperor uh, Caligula at the time makes his decision, he says, you have misruled King Herod Antipas. You have misruled and he banishes him. I've read to either Spain or Gaul, which is like France slash Germany, you know, whatever that region somewhere over there, he banishes him to the west. And what's interesting is Herodias goes with him to her credit. She goes with him. 
Um, all right, so anyway, Herod Agrippa the first, this uh, King Herod Agrippa is the guy who's responsible for killing uh, James, the brother of John, these two sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder. In chapter 12 of the Acts of the Apostles, it's Herod Agrippa who has James uh, put to death with a sword, executed with a sword. And then there's another Herod Agrippa II in Acts chapter 26 that uh, St. Paul is trying to convert in, when he's in prison in Caesarea, okay, on the coast there, Caesarea Maritima on the coast. He's in prison there for a while. And uh, he tries to convert this guy, <laughs> King Herod Agrippa II. Uh, very interesting. All right, you ready to move on? Uh, hit the pause if you want to take a little bathroom break here or something or get you fizzy water. And, uh, and then we're going to now tackle uh, the feeding of the 5,000. So it's the only miracle in all four Gospels. Isn't that interesting? And I just have to start out by saying, have you lost your appetite seeing the severed, bloody head of St. John the Baptist with the hairpin sticking out of the tongue? Do you really feel like eating at this point? Doesn't that kind of make you nauseous? That whole episode we just read about is so awful, so violent. Oof. But anyway, let's move on. So, first thing I want to notice is the balance of our Lord, you know. we got to store energy. Can't let ourselves get too depleted. And our Lord's teaching the apostles this. Priests have to learn this lesson. You know, we got to keep a little something in reserve all the time. We got to be ready to respond to emergencies. We're like firemen. We have to slide down the pole. And all of us parents, and whatever whatever our life is, we're all busy. And we have to keep some energy in reserve. We shouldn't be in fourth gear all the time. Only a little bit. Here and there, we need to be in fourth gear. We need to drop it into second and third. I'm convinced most of our life, we should be in second or third gear. And um, so our Lord, he's like, look, and, and we're more productive when we do that, okay? Uh, he drew drew them apart to a, a, a desolate or lonely place apart, Eremos, you know, okay? Uh, a wilderness region. When Jesus heard this about St. John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a lonely place apart. Uh, but the crowds hear it and they come to him. So, yeah, we have to live. Um, there's a lesson in this for all of us, you know, parents, priests, whatever. Okay, at times, you know, our best laid plans. We're finally going to sit down uh, to relax or something. All day long, we've been working towards that moment. And then you hear this just when you're on the couch with a piece of cake and a glass of milk uh, with your husband and you're going to relax and watch the show that you've been into and you hear this mom from upstairs uh, I know we've all experienced these types of things uh, and just just that's what happens to our Lord here so if we're entirely depleted because we've been at the red line um, and just uh, going full out pedal to the metal um you know we can't absorb these types of things so our lord he's managing himself managing himself uh and we have to live in that tension uh you know always kind of like um we should be inclined towards to be generous you know it should be our default position to try to be generous but also aware of our limitations uh, that it's uh you know, ultimately all smoke and no fire. If um, uh, we got to keep oil in the engine or we're going to burn out. Uh, we got to rest and pray and uh, fill ourselves up. And you see our Lord doing that. He, uh, If his tank gets emptied, he's make sure he fills it up again the best he can. Um, and uh, we have to live in that tension between those two things, the demands upon us and our need to take care of ourselves. And... Uh, fill up our tank again um so anyway 
enough about that. Uh, so Mark says something interesting here. He adds two little details to the story that I want to point out. He says that the, the grass, not just there was lots of grass. St. John says that. But he says there was, uh, the grass was green. I just think that's interesting. Uh, he says that the grass uh, was very green. And uh, upon the green grass, I think that's important. Why is that important? Uh, well, the word grass is kortos, okay? And later, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all use this word satisfied. The people, when they ate the bread and the fish, they were satisfied. And that word is kortazo, okay? So kortos is grass. It's related to the word kortazo. They were later satisfied. What am I getting at here? Uh, what I'm leading towards is that this grass was green. In other words, these were green pastures. So it was in Mark that our Lord looks at the people and says, with compassion, okay, Splank, it's oh my, uh, his guts were moved, stirred. He had a visceral, your viscera, your guts, a visceral reaction when he saw the crowd. He had compassion on them. Uh, and uh, why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So the sheep aren't too smart. They don't even know how to find green grass for themselves. Well, Mark adds this little detail that the grass was green. And then they're later uh, satisfied, cortazo. So it's like there's an underlying metaphor, I think, perhaps being alluded to here. That Jesus is the shepherd. He's leading these people to green pasture, to green grass, where they can uh, fill their bellies and be satisfied. Cortazo uh, is this, this sense of filling up with fodder. Okay, like animals at the feeding trough until they've completely filled themselves with whatever animals eat, their fodder. Okay, Cortazo. So he's a good shepherd. He's the good shepherd leading them uh, to pasture. Now, another image could be here. Um, interesting. It, it's, it's really only in the Greek. But in chapter 39, uh, he commanded them all to sit down by companies on the grass. But then he switches words in chapter uh, 6, verse 40 of Mark's gospel. He switches words in verse 40. And so they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. So he switches from companies to groups. Uh, the word for group is interesting. Uh, uh oh, what is that word? Um, Didn't I write that down? Okay, I forgot what the word is. But it has a connotation. I mean, the derivative of whatever that word is, uh, is uh, a flower bed. A flower bed. Uh, so it has this imagery of flowers that the people in all their different vesture in these groups of 50s and 100s, they look like flower beds. So there's something kind of beautiful, a garden theme here going on, maybe, too, that the people are like the vineyard of the Lord. So I was trying to press into that a little bit, have a little fun with that. Um, and all I found was a uh, song of songs uh, is what came to mind. The very end, the last three verses of the song of songs, you know, Solomon had a vineyard. And my vineyard, my very own self is for myself. My vineyard, my very own is for myself. You, O Solomon, have the thousand and the keepers of the fruit, two hundred. O you who dwell in the gardens, my companions are listening for your voice. Let me hear it. O you who dwell in the gardens... My companions are listening for your voice. Let me hear it. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountain of spices. I don't know. There's so much great garden, vineyard imagery here. Um, 
maybe Isaiah chapter 5 too. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't want to go too far, but certainly Isaiah chapter 5, he develops this theme of the of the vineyard quite a bit. Um, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Um, but uh, yeah, just uh, it's a great image to picture all these people and think of them as beds of flowers or a garden. It's something kind of cool that belongs to the Lord, the gardens, um, these people. All right, enough about that. Um, that's as far as I could get with that, but it's just neat. Eucharistic overtones here abound, all right, to the feeding of the 5,000, all right, as is very Eucharistic. Has a very should be read in a very Eucharistic context. I'm going to give you some little uh, reasons why that is the case. First of all, in Matthew 14, 15, it says, when it was evening. Well, he's going to say the same thing at the Last Supper. When it was evening in verse 20, chapter 26, verse 20. So when it was evening is another a little connector. Okay. Uh, wow. Interesting. Um, connecting it to the Last Supper. And then also he looks up to heaven. Uh, this is in Luke 9, 16. In Luke's version, he says, Our Lord, before he prayed or whatever, he looked up to heaven. Now, this is in Eucharistic prayer 1, okay? It's the longest Eucharistic prayer. I don't know if 4 is longer. I'm not exactly sure. But Eucharistic prayer 1 is really long. And it's also called the Roman Canon. And in that, uh, the priest is instructed literally to look up to heaven. So in the rubrics, the little red, rubra means red, the little red print that tells the priest what to do, you know, the actions and ritual gestures and actions and things, uh, tells him what to do in between the black verses, you know, that you're to read. Uh, you have the rubrics, and at those words, looking up to heaven, uh, the priest is told in the rubrics to actually look up. So if you ever hear a priest Using Eucharistic Prayer 1, the Roman canon, you'll see him do that. Looking up to heaven to you as Almighty Father. All right. Now, um, so he looks up to heaven. That should make us think of the Eucharist right there. And then when he had given thanks, in John's version in chapter 6, verse 11, it says, when he had given thanks. And what's that word? Given thanks. Eucharisteo. Uh, same word uh, where we derive Eucharist from when he had given thanks all right uh, now also this formula that you see in Matthew Mark and Luke of he took blessed broke and gave uh, that is very Eucharistic um, listen to the Eucharistic prayer and you'll hear it uh, but then the disciples distribute this just like the Eucharist. It's a foretaste of the Eucharist. And he gives it to the disciples to give to the crowd. Um, so our Lord is the primary agent in the Eucharist, okay? Uh, the priest just stands, or bishop, stands at the altar in the place, in the person of Christ. Uh, we are just a secondary instrument. Our Lord is the primary agent, or he's the one doing it, okay? It's Christ you should see at the altar. And then somehow in and through the priest. And then the priest and the other ministers distribute uh, this Eucharistic bread uh, to the crowds. So also in John's gospel, he mentions that it was at the time of the Passover, uh, which is a further allusion uh, to the Eucharist. And also John says they could have, they had as much as they wanted. Um, so now we're going to look at some uh, Old Testament um Prefigurements are foreshadowings of the Eucharist. First of all, we're all aware of the manna. Manna is so interesting. It's like literally, what is it? You know, the what is it? Exodus 16. Uh, they're given this manna. Manu in Hebrew literally means, what is it? You know, it's mysterious. Like coriander seed and uh, bedellium. Uh, but uh, yeah. It's kind of a mysterious thing, the Eucharist, uh, to say the least. Very mysterious. Well, it has a forebear. It has a forerunner. It has a, a, something anticipating it in the Old Testament. Very clearly, this manna uh, that was kept in a jar also. Um, 
inside the Ark of the Covenant, some of the manna. Now, Elijah also, uh, there's this miraculous uh, jar of meal and cruise of oil for that widow, okay, uh, that he, uh, he, he basically uh, says this prayer that uh, in 1 Kings chapter 17, you know, that it'll never run dry and it never did. So it's kind of a multiplication or uh, some sort of, um, yeah, uh, amazing miracle that he performed uh, for this woman, this widow. And her jar of meal and her cruise of oil never ran out. Um, so Elisha, the prophet, also I already mentioned, um, in Second Kings chapter 4, verses 42 to 44, that was the first reading last weekend uh, to go along with John chapter 6 and the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, it's noteworthy that uh, they put that passage from uh, uh, Second Kings chapter 4 about Elisha multiplying uh, these uh, 20 barley loaves for 100 men. Um, and John, I already said, specifies that these were barley loaves that our Lord multiplied, okay? So there are 5,000 men. Um, hang on, I'm going to just take a quick break. Okay, while well, I was on my little break, uh, I did look up that word. It's prasia, prasia, uh, or flower bed. Uh, it's related to the word for leek in Greek. Not leek as in leaky boat, but the plant or vegetable leek, um, which is, a, you know, kind of greenish, you know, has greenish color. So anyway, it's very interesting because that word is modified to mean like a greenish color at times in the Old Testament. I did do a lot of research on this and consulted with two PhDs in our parish, those two guys in our parish, um, I emailed them about this so that I wouldn't get too far afield, so to speak. Uh, this word "prasia" or "group" in Mark chapter in Matt, Mark chapter six, uh, whether or not there's a real um, case to be made that this is flower bed here, um, that uh, there's a garden-like imagery to the people gathered in these groups or "prasia." And they both agreed that, yeah, there could be something to that. There could be something to that in terms of the use of that word. Um, I, I dug into it for a while, and honestly, I think I'm just going to leave it right there. Um, so anyway, 5,000 men. This is a Jewish way of counting crowds. You can look at Exodus 1237. You know, you just count the men. And, uh, and what's interesting is that in Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, they're preaching in the temple. Uh, namely John and Peter. And uh, what does it say there? But uh, first of all, a couple of little things that might be a hint or a clue that could connect it to this story. First of all, that it was uh, that it was in the evening. It was already evening when they were arrested. And it also says that uh, there are 5,000 converts. So when I hear 5,000, and once again, this repetition, uh, that it was already evening, um, hmm, does that evoke or call to mind? Go read Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. And uh, in the context of the multiplication of the loaves and the fish, the time of day reference of evening, and also that it was there were 5,000 uh, of those who came to believe. All right. And decide if you think uh, there's something going on there. But uh, anyway, there it is. Now, uh, when the people saw the sign which he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the hills by himself. Particularly, they're going to make him king. Okay. And we already talked about how Herod Antipas, whose territory they are in right now, Herod Antipas uh, is, uh, you know, covetous of the title king, and he never gets it. So they're going to make him king. Anyway, and you just heard what happened to St. John the Baptist. All right, so look, he, he withdrew from there by himself. So this is 
John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Now, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. What is that a reference to? None, none other than the prophet that was like Moses. In Deuteronomy, chapter 18, Moses famously says, There will be a prophet like me one day who will come, and him you shall listen to or heed. Okay? Uh, so when our Lord is on the Mount of Transfiguration, and the voice of the Father says, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Uh, it's kind of a reference to Deuteronomy 18. Okay. Um, yeah. So, look, they're saying this is the prophet. You see that in elsewhere in John's gospel, you know. Like, are you the prophet? They asked John the Baptist. Are you, who are you? Are you the prophet? You know, are you Elijah? Are you the Christ? You know. So they're looking for this fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18, a prophet like Moses that is to come one day. So presumably to give a new law and lead the people out of bondage and slavery on a great exodus. Um, and our Lord does all those things. So he is the new Moses. And he says it very much in John 5. 46 he says if you believe Moses you would believe me for he wrote of me okay you know, basically saying I am the fulfillment of that prophecy of Moses in Deuteronomy 18 I'm the prophet like Moses that is to come into the world all right so anyway now uh take heed beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod something you find in Mark 8 15 the leaven of Herod and the Pharisees um, Matthew in chapter 16 verses 5 to 12 says the you know same kind of argument of uh, the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees anyway I just that's interesting the notion of leavening leaven uh, but he also mentions in Mark this leaven of Herod um, hmm something to think about leaven uh, yeast you know, gets in the dough and makes it rise. Uh, leaven of Herod and the Pharisees. Leaven, air, pockets of air that get in the and raise the dough. Um, yeah, leaven. Yeah, I mean, I can just only think of conceit or pride, you know, uh, puffed up. Um, but uh, when I think of leaven, uh, now, do 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 you not yet understand in Mark eighteen, fourteen to twenty one? You know, uh, he says, "Do you not yet understand? Do, 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 are you getting it?" Um, it's just interesting when he says that later on about the loaves and the fish. You know, because now he will perform both miracles because uh, there is a, a feeding of four thousand, but you only find it in Matthew and Mark. It's not in Luke or John. There's a, a second feeding or multiplication of loaves and fish, namely the feeding of the 4,000 in a Gentile region. It's going to be in the next chapter. We'll be hearing about it in chapter 15 of Matthew's gospel. So that'll be interesting to compare these two multiplication stories. This one for the 5,000 is primarily a Jewish crowd, and they take up 12 baskets full of leftovers. Okay, and in the feeding of the 4,000, they're going to take up seven baskets. So later on in Mark's gospel, he's going to challenge them. Do you not yet understand, you know, the meaning and the symbolism of these 12 baskets and the seven baskets? Our Lord's going to ask them, do you not yet understand um, the meaning of these baskets? Maybe we'll get into that when we get there um, to the next chapter. But uh, of Matthew here, we'll talk more about this. Uh, but let's move on to the walking on the sea. So interesting. It's the only uh, gospel that records Peter walking on the sea. Only Matthew gives us that little bit. Uh, so, And the walking on the sea is in Matthew, Mark, and John. But for whatever reason, Luke does not include this story of the walking on the sea. Uh, but our Lord needed solitude for prayer. And he, uh, you know realize going back to what we started with you know when he withdrew in the first place after hearing of the death of saint john the baptist he withdrew apart to a, a 
a lonely place in the wilderness um, with his apostles. It didn't work out so good. But now our Lord's like, okay, I had compassion on this crowd. And uh, he heals their sick. He feeds them. And now he's going to go get some much needed rest. So he goes up there for prayer and rest on top of this mountain, I guess. I mean, it's like a hillside alongside the Sea of Galilee. Uh, most of it, it's like a big bowl. So he can climb up to the lip of this bowl and just lay down in the grass um, and and store up some energy for whatever comes next. He has to spend time with his Heavenly Father to store energy and fill his tank. So that's what he does. And, you know, this walking on the water thing is so fascinating. When I was a kid, tell me if you've ever done this, but we used to have, go to this public pool. And I used to try to walk on the water. Um, never worked. But I would run and jump into the pool, kind of on a run, and, and, and try to take a couple steps before I went in. Anyway, it was just kind of funny. Like, I would get, like, a couple quick steps and then go under. Uh, so, yeah, I never got to walk on water. But there's a cool scene in that movie, The Shack. If you haven't seen that movie, it's worth seeing. Uh, based on that book, The Shack. And uh, this guy has the spiritual experience. And he spends a weekend or whatever. Spends some time at this, like, vacation home with uh, the Trinity. Okay? And he hangs out with Jesus. And they go walking across this lake together. It's just really cool. Um, so anyway, yeah, I always wanted to do that. Uh, but only in Matthew would get this story about Peter doing it. Peter gets to do that. The only person, presumably, in human history that got to walk on top of the water. Um, now, first thing we want to notice is that our Lord made the disciples get into the boat. So let's picture the scene, will we? Shall we? Okay, you got uh, this crowd of 5,000 men and all these women and children, and they just had this miracle performed in the place. It's just, can you imagine that the, the people are, John tells us, want to take him, carry him off, and make him king? I mean, this is a real problem, especially with what just happened with St. John the Baptist. The apostles, I would imagine, are freaking out. And they want to get our Lord out of there. And this is counterintuitive that our Lord commands with the strongest possible language. He commands the apostles to get into the boat. So we got to look at this Greek word because this is interesting. Imagine just, just the electricity of this moment. Unprecedented, you know, except for Elisha in the Old Testament. But on this grand scale, even Elisha didn't perform a miracle uh, of this magnitude feeding this enormous crowd far lower, larger than Elisha and he uh, and there's people who are like yeah just trying to uh, organize this effort to make him king so he uses this word to force or compel Anakazo it's a command in the strongest uh, possible sense Ankale is arm okay uh, ankos is a bent or uplifted arm. So anakazo, this, this verb, comes from the word for an upright bent arm. It's like, get in the boat. It's, uh, yeah, strongest possible order, compelling or forcing them to get into the boat, which implies they didn't want to get in the boat. They didn't want to abandon him on the shore with this crazy crowd. And can you can you fault them for that? Can you blame them for that? What a dramatic scene this must have been. It's almost dark. And our, it, it makes no sense whatsoever that our Lord had to resort to this uh, incredibly strong gesture of a bent, raised, upright arm, his right arm. And had to give them this uh, strongest possible command, compelling, forcing them into the boat. You can just imagine the mind of Peter. Maybe it was his boat, who knows. But you know, he also knows like the patterns of the wind. And he knows, like, we're not going to be able to get across the lake right now, Lord. We're going into a headwind. He's probably standing there in the water trying to explain this to our Lord. Our Lord's listening to him. 
Our Lord knows what he's going to do. And Peter's also worried about our Lord leaving with all the apostles in a boat, leaving our Lord on the shore with this crazy crowd. And our Lord saying, I'm going to dismiss the crowd. Don't worry about it. I'll dismiss the crowd. I'll take care of this enormous crowd by myself. I don't need you. This is a test of the emergency broadcasting system. Beep. This is a test, man, um, of Peter and the apostles. And hence, our Lord has to use this powerful form of command. This is a very dramatic, electric moment. But our Lord knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. And somehow he's able to dismiss that crowd. Doesn't use the same dramatic word, Anakazo, but it's like he dismisses that crowd somehow and walks away and slips through the crowd. It's dark, and I guess he's just able to get away and sneak up the mountain. Uh, and they don't know where he went. Uh, so anyway, our Lord takes care of it. And he goes up there and prays until the fourth watch of the night, which is between 3 and 6 a.m. Uh, it's kind of a Roman thing uh, to designate these periods of watch of three hours uh, the night into these three watches. This is the last watch between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Our Lord finally sees them out there and goes out there. Um and what's interesting, too, is, you know, I mean, our Lord, he slips away, we hear, you know, from John tells us he withdrew from them. Like, he just got away from this crowd. He's not going to let them make him king. Okay, so he's he gets away from them. And he's trying to lose this crowd, and maybe that's part of why our Lord uh, sent his apostles across the lake. Because he's like, you know, if I stay back and they see you all leave and they're going to come looking for me here in the morning, this crowd. And uh, but they don't know that I've walked across the lake. No one's going to expect that. So maybe this is like our Lord pulling a fast one on this crowd. He's trying to put this crowd in the rearview mirror. And I, I guess he figures the best way to do it. Maybe send the apostles in the sight of this entire crowd. They see his apostles get in a boat and leave. And they know he stayed behind. They know it. He dismisses them. Then he slips away. And the crowd comes looking for him. And when they finally find him on the other side of the lake, what do they say in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 25? When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And then he's going to launch into his bread of life discourse which we're going to be hearing for the next few weeks on the next few Sundays. Started it this weekend. Every uh, three years when we're, when we're in lectionary year two uh, focuses on Mark's gospel uh, in the Sunday lectionary. Uh, we cycle between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And when we're on Mark, which is year B, uh, which we're in right now, uh, Mark's the shortest of the gospels. Uh, so they stick John's bread of life discourse in there for like a whole month, you know, four or five weeks straight, depending. Uh, in the middle of year B, they stick that in there. So every three years when we come around to Mark, uh, we run into John chapter six. So we're going to be in that for the next few weeks. Hey, that's great, isn't it? In the context of um, our little Matthew Bible study here. And talking about the uh, great divine choreography here uh, with all of this. How our study is lining up with uh, John's uh, Bread of Life discourse is cool. So that's the exact moment here. Um, now, they're wondering, how in the world did you get here, Rabbi? Because they don't know he walked across at three in the morning across the dang lake. Um, now, let's... Flip to the apostles for a second. Uh, they're out there and the wind is against them. And they're being tortured, the word, uh, basenidzo. Basenidzo is this great word. It literally means trial by torture. Okay, so it's a very strong word here. Yeah, it gets translated buffeted by the waves. But they're getting... <laughs> 
mauled by the waves, okay? They're getting mauled by the waves. Uh, Basenizo, trial by torture. Wow, uh, they're in desperate straits out there. And I can understand that based on some experiences I've had crossing big lakes in Minnesota against the wind. And our outward bound instructors taught us uh, we had to take short strokes. You got to take short strokes. You got to shorten up your stroke by like half. You can't take long, deep strokes because while you're bringing the paddle back up for the next stroke, uh, you're losing all that headway you were making. So you're just going, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the way to make headway and when you're going against the wind is just take short strokes uh, so that you, uh, you know, minimize the amount of time in between strokes so that you're just kind of going across the lake or whatever. And uh, that's what I'm imagining. The sail's not working, obviously, in this case. So what are they doing? They're resorting to the road, to the oars. And they're probably just really having to work hard. And I mean, imagine they have to take turns. They're arguing. Guys are exhausted who have done a spell in the oars. They got blisters all over their hands. Uh, guys who aren't used to doing this. I mean, this is really stressful uh, trying to get across the lake. And the whole time, what's going through their mind? They're trying to process what happened that day, all the drama of the events. And then trying to understand our Lord's actions and sending them across because it doesn't say he explained what his plan was. They don't know why he's sending them across the lake and remaining on the on the other side. Now, this doesn't, it's absolutely, uh, does not, is illogical, does not make any sense to them, but our Lord's testing them. It's a trial by torture in a certain sense. Maybe our Lord does this sort of thing to all of us in our life sometimes. He just wants us to trust him. Uh, there's a lesson here. It's very interesting. Uh, but they're against the wind. So now, uh, they are way out there. Uh, John says they're three or four miles out. Matthew says many furlongs. A furlong is an eighth of a mile. So anyway, uh, 200 meters. So they're way the heck out there. So they're not seeing our Lord walking along the shore. He's walking on top of the sea. Okay, so forget anything you've ever might have heard about, uh, you know, they're along the shoreline and they see our little, now that's bogus. Peter was on top of the sea and then he started to sink. There's no way around it. Uh, Jesus was walking on top of the water. Okay, this is a miraculous event. Uh, so forget that. They were way the heck out in the middle of this lake that's 13 miles long and 8 miles wide. Okay, it's big. And... Uh, they're way the heck out there, three or four miles in the middle of the blasted thing. Now, um, they think they're seeing an apparition or ghost. It's translated many times as ghost. Uh, the word is phantas phantasmos. Phantasmos is only used two times in the New Testament, and only in this case in Matthew and in, in Mark's account. Uh, those are the only two places you find this word phantas phantasmos. Phantasm, you know, so it can be translated ghost or apparition uh, of some kind or other. Uh, those are the only two times in the New Testament. It's only used twice in the Old Testament, too. But in both of those cases, it's not a ghost. It doesn't fit uh, the story. In Job chapter 20, verse 8, or in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 7. So it's very rarely used. It's so interesting. They're, anyway, if nothing else, you know. Shows that they were just as scared of ghosts as they are, as we are today. You know, there was a belief in ghosts. And um, uh, who knows what they were seeing. But what's interesting is they cried, so they cried out. This is an onomatopoeic. Is that a word? Onomatopoeic. On, it's an onomatopoeia, uh, which means a word that sounds like what it is, or what it signifies. Sound The word itself sounds like what it signifies. Crazo. Okay, it's kind of like, uh, you know, call, you know, of a, of a, of a um, raven or something, uh, or a croak or a shriek, okay? Uh, inarticulate sounds came out of their mouth. Have you ever been so scared that you actually made a sound like that? These guys are tired, okay? 
And at this point of the night, when they see that, <laughs> it would have been, it would have gone viral on the YouTube, on YouTube if one of them would have had their phone out and videoed this moment. When they all saw that somebody saw it first, saw our Lord first, you know, started to see something. What the heck is that? And then they see the form of a man and see our Lord with his robes blowing in the wind and his hair. And uh, they're way the heck out there. They're deliriously tired, deliriously tired and confused and befuddled and exhausted. And uh, they see that whoever saw it and screamed and pointed and they all look, you know, imagine the collective shriek. They were all freaking out, wigging out uh, when they saw that. So this moment of extreme terror, terrazzo is the word that's used to describe their state, uh, which is, yeah, something that's agitated or shaken, okay, is the connotation of that word. Now, they, uh, at that moment, in this total darkness, in those conditions, big waves and swells, and this incredible wind that's torturing them. Uh, Peter, you know, gets out of the boat. I, I just, this is one of the most amazing things. I cannot believe that because we don't realize how dark it is out on the water. You got to think about that. Unless you've experienced it, when you're on the water in the dark, it's scary. Okay, the water looks like ink. You can't see anything. It is extremely scary. So what Peter did here. It's just mind-boggling to me that he got out of that boat to begin with. It's just amazing. So this is a fascinating and dramatic story. And what's interesting here is we also get another little detail in Mark chapter 6, verse 48. Uh, he says that our Lord meant to pass them by. Now, that is worth noting because Exodus 33, 32, uh, you have... Um, uh, Moses on this uh, mountain, remember, he asks to see the Lord, and the Lord passed him by, let him see his back, he wouldn't let him see his face, but, you know, it's this mystical encounter between Moses and God, the Lord, and the Lord walked past him, uh, same kind of expression there, passed him by, and the same thing in First Kings chapter 19, Elijah's back on the Mount of Transfiguration, and once again, the Lord passed him by. Remember, that same expression is used. And it's very interesting So that Mark would say that, that our Lord meant to pass them by. I think that adds to the theophany here. When anybody heard that expression, they would immediately think of Moses and Elijah, <laughs> who are appearing to our Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration. In chapter 17 coming up, but uh, the Lord meant to pass them by. Uh, so interesting. Now he says to them, take heart and do not be afraid. Take heart is that word tharsai. It's uh, used when our Lord heals the paralytic that got lowered through Peter's roof. Also the woman, the hemorrhaging woman. He uses that word tharsai. And the Septuagint, that's a really poignant word. That's the word Moses uses in Exodus 14, 12, when he tells the people, to don't be afraid. Uh, Exodus 14, 13. Moses says, Fear not, Tharsai. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be still. So you can't get a more poignant moment than that. The Israel Israelites have their back up against the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army, the most powerful army in the world, with all his chariots and charioteers, bearing down on them with their back against the Red Sea. They're freaking out. They are wigging out. And uh, he uses that word, tharsai. So anyway, it's a word that our Lord likes to use, uh, seemingly, because he uses it uh, fairly often. Uh, and he uses it in John's gospel. In the world, you will have tribulation. But tharsai, be of good cheer or be of good heart or take courage. Tharsai, I have overcome the world. Okay, in the world you will have tribulation, but do not fear, I have overcome the world. Actually, my translation says, be of good cheer. Tharsai, what a cool word used at these incredibly poignant moments. That's the word chosen here. 
uh, when our Lord tries to settle them down. Now, um, next he's going to say, I am. Let's talk about that. He says, Tharsai, do not be afraid. I am. Okay? I am. Uh, do not be afraid. Take heart or take courage. I am. Do not be afraid is uh, what our Lord says. This I am, ego eimi, is the transliteration, is the translation into Greek of the name of God, Yahweh, in Exodus 3.14, when God reveals himself in the burning bush to Moses as I am. Who shall I say sent me to you? When he, Moses says, when I go to Pharaoh, like you asked, what am I going to tell him? Who, who am I going to say sent me? And then God says, tell him I am sent you. Tell him I am. Yahweh, okay, sent you. I am who I am. Ego Amy is how it's translated in Greek, okay? I am. Now, that's the very word that our Lord uses here. Some people might say, it doesn't mean anything. He's just saying, it is I. Uh, there's no way, okay? There's no way. Uh, that's bogus, all right? Uh, Pope Benedict XVI says in his book, Jesus in Nazareth, page 352, there is no doubt, no doubt, that the whole event is a theophany, okay, a manifestation of God, an encounter with the mystery of Jesus' identity. So when he's talking about this ego amy, this, these words of our Lord, when he says, I am, he's not just saying, hey guys, no, it's just me over here, it's just me, don't be afraid. No, he's saying these words that are incredibly powerful. He says, take heart, I am, do not be afraid. Same guy who just multiplied loaves and fish back there for 5,000 people. Now he's standing on the water in a storm, doing something only God can do. And what do they say? They say, you are the son of God when he gets in the boat and they worship him. Okay, uh, this is extraordinary. So... They're starting to get it. It's starting to dawn on them. And it's going to take time for the church to digest this. That our Lord is not just a Messiah, an earthly Messiah, a human Messiah. He is the Son of God. And that means he shares, is consubstantial. We finally get it really nice and crystal clear at the Council of Nicaea in the 3rd century. Okay, 4th century, sorry. 325. Uh... 323, 325. Okay, the Council of Nicaea, I uh, chose to use the word consubstantial with the Father that we use in our creed on Sundays, the Nicene Creed, okay, uh, that he is equal to the Father. That is huge. Uh, we got to bring his humanity and his divinity together, okay? Wonder twin powers activate, okay? That's when the Catholic faith comes alive. Uh, so very important that we plug in to the source, all right? The source of the power flowing through the church, flowing through her sacraments, is the divinity and the humanity of Christ conjoined. That this guy that looks just like the rest of us is actually consubstantial with the Father. Unbelievable. So awesome. So there's an inbreaking of the revelation here of Jesus' true identity. Not only the fact that he was passing them by, that language that he meant to pass them by, that Peter, interestingly, gives us in Mark's gospel. Uh, that's basically Peter's memoirs, uh, most people think, of Mark's gospel. Now, um, so anyway, now... Uh, yeah, there's other places in Isaiah where you hear this I am language, chapter 41, verse 4, 43, 1 to 12. Read through there and see these uh, if you want. And hear these uh, this descriptive language of God speaking as the I am. Now, John 8, 58, you know, before Abraham was, I am. 54 times in John's gospel, you hear this expression, ego, amy. Uh, it's very important in John, but you also find it here in Matthew and Mark. This I am statement uh, is made and here and in this story. Uh, but so this is very much taken up by John and is very integral to his gospel. 
There are these I am statements of our Lord. 54 times we hear it repeated. Okay, uh, just as an example, John 8, 58, for Abraham was I am, all right? Unequivocally re referenced to God's name in the burning bush, Exodus 3, 14. Yahweh, I am, all right? Now, seven times they're specifically intended by John and linked in a very special way with some image, salvific image. Uh, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. Someday we'll go through John's gospel, but let's leave that right there. All right, let's switch now to Peter and talk about Peter a little bit. First of all, he's impetuous. Yeah, God bless him, man. Uh, he's impetuous and impulsive. Um, so, and our Lord likes him. Our Lord likes him because he has an authenticity about him and a, a deep humility. There's something in him that our, our Lord really likes. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at a bird outside the window. I don't think that's a wren. I think it's just a sparrow. But anyway, I get cool birds to land on this dogwood out here sometimes. All right, now um, I want to quote uh, Romano Guardini, but as we're reflecting on Paul, let's just realize, okay, he's always plunging in, plunging in with his mouth, you know, or his body, in this case, plunging in. And later, after our Lord rises, and he's walking along the shore, and they, John identifies it's the Lord, and Peter jumps into the water. He's the first one to just grab his clothes and plunge in, start swimming towards our Lord. He's running with John to the tomb, on well, Resurrection Sunday, okay, in the morning. He's the one running to the tomb. Uh, he's always plunging in. He's the first one to plunge into the tomb. Um, so, look, like him or not, I mean, the guy, you got to give it to this guy. This is incredible. If you put yourself in that boat, I tell you, this is one of the most remarkable things I've ever heard that he did this. Uh, so, Peter, yeah, we can make fun of him and say, yeah, he's over the edge. He's over the edge. Well, I maintain the people, the only people who really know where the edge are, are the people who've been over a couple times. All right. Uh, so I like Peter and our Lord likes Peter. Now let's talk about and make a distinction here. When our Lord performs this miracle, yeah, to Peter, it's amazing. And to the apostles watching our Lord multiply loaves and fish and now standing on the water at night in the middle of a storm, many furlongs out from the shoreline. Pretty pretty miraculous supernatural event, wouldn't you say? Pretty astounding and, and extraordinary. Uh, well, there's a different way to look at this. I think Romano Guardini, this priest philosopher from the 20th century, can help us on this point. I I used this quote in my homily this past weekend. Uh, listen to this. What for mortals, even for those far advanced in faith, must remain an unspeakable miracle is for him, for our Lord. Um, but the natural expression of his intrinsic being. Yeah, for us, it's this amazing, extraordinary ev event. An unspeakable miracle. Something supernatural, but for him, it's natural. It's a natural expression of his intrinsic being. He's not doing anything supernatural. Not for him. For us, it might be supernatural. For him, it's natural. This is totally, it's not extraordinary for him. It's ordinary. Uh, it's extraordinary to us. But it's neat to make that distinction between our Lord and, and the rest of us, okay? Because he's utterly separate and different. Uh, he's, he is the great I am, consubstantial with the Father. Different kind of being, utterly separate and different from us, uncreated being. Christ himself does not believe. This is an interesting point. He simply is who he is. He doesn't believe. He doesn't need to have faith. He doesn't need to believe. He just is. We have to believe and have faith. He doesn't. It's interesting to think of our Lord that way. To think that our Lord didn't have faith. He didn't need faith. He didn't believe. He didn't need to believe. Uh, that's so interesting. He's the author of reality. 
Christ himself does not believe. He simply is who he is, God's son. To believe means to share not what Christ believes, but that he is. Thus, Peter here is participating in this power, and it's part of Jesus' act. He's entering into reality, Peter here, by virtue of his faith. Uh, he is entering into the agency of our Lord's reality as the Son of God, as the great I Am. He's touching out, grasping and seizing hold of it. And being empowered by that reality. Um, he becomes a part of Jesus' act. He participates in this power by virtue of his faith. What the believing soul experiences is not just some truth or value. But a reality. The reality. The reality of God in the living Christ. Faith is the act of seizing this reality, of building one's life on it, of becoming part of it. The life of faith demands a revolution in our sense of reality. Daily, earnest exercise of faith is what alters our sense of reality. Experience of genuine reality must be our aim. I like to call this reality therapy. I'm going to be making a meditation. I already made a guided meditation called reality therapy i just haven't published it yet because i'm also making a talk uh to go with it that i've been working on for weeks months really off and on uh i gotta get this thing out of my system but it's a talk and a guided meditation that kind of correspond to each other and entitled both of them are entitled reality therapy and take up some of these ideas here that romano guardini gets at the metaphysics of faith that faith is a vision of what truly is the case, the true state of affairs. It's entering into reality. Uh, heaven is the ultimate realization of this reality, uh, a hyper heightened state of reality. Uh, but we can have a foretaste of it now through the life of faith. We enter into reality, the metaphysics of faith. Reality therapy is not just nice truths and notions or you know pi nice pious notions or values. Okay, no, no, no. It's what truly is the case. Um, we're in contact with... That's so cool to me. A really, really, really... Uh, um, grabs my brain. Uh, I can barely hold it for just a second. We're, we're just in the soup, the fog. But uh, for moments of clarity, for just a second, I can kind of hold it like the vision of faith. Saints, the prophets, are the ones who are living in reality. Okay, uh, they're so conformed to it uh, that they're able to actually enter into uh, that power. Um, it's a participation in the power that flows from Christ. When you're a saint, when you're a prophet, you begin to participate in that power, and you're like hovering between this like. Uh, between the, between the two worlds. Look at Padre Pio. I mean, you just start to mix it up. The prophet Elisha, you know, it's just like by location is no big deal. The, the types of miracles performed by some of these really, really incredible mystic saints and prophets like Elisha or Padre Pio or something are just mind bending. But, uh, you know, actually they're just participating in reality. They're the true realists, the supreme realists. Um, I like this. Do not lean on your own understanding. Peter here, you know, he's having a hard time with all this stuff, you know. Um, probably resisted our Lord on the shores of the Sea of Galilee when our Lord tried to send him away. And now he's going to go across the water, but he hears that wind. He feels that wind. And he looks away and takes his eyes off Jesus. Do not lean on your own understanding. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5. Do not lean on your own understanding. Incredible prophecy in Daniel chapter 12 of the resurrection. He says, that, you know, in the end times, the last days, 
knowledge will increase and everybody's going to run to and fro. Uh, that's so interesting. That's like our own time, 20th century here. The, the advances in knowledge, there were no laptops. There were no cell phones when I grew up, no computers uh, that we had uh, until I got to college. Um, so it's just amazing the advances. It's just, you know, knowledge is increasing. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Okay, there's so much knowledge, you know, and uh, and these current events. Like, we're so impressed with our knowledge. Don't rely upon, don't lean on your own understanding. Okay, we're so impressed by all the technological achievements and scientific discoveries and everything we're learning and about the physical universe. You know, knowledge is increasing like a flood. Yeah, maybe. Uh, knowledge shall increase and people are running to and fro. Okay, but if we take our eyes off the Lord, it's a very unwise thing to do. And lean upon our own understanding. And maybe that's what's symbolized here by St. Peter uh, sinking into the water. Save me, Lord. Okay, what makes him sink? You know, he took his eyes off the Lord. Um, you know, the... the I think I talked about the road of Fortuna, you know, it's like this wheel of fortune. You know, we get drawn out towards the edge, you know, constant pulling us away from Christ. We have to resist that. The cyclone or vortex of our lives, of the news cycle, you know, is constantly trying to get us to take our eyes off our Lord. This violent wind uh, blowing against us, this headwind trying to get us to take our eyes off the Lord, this contemplative gaze we have to keep it fixed on the lord if we want to stay in the middle of that wheel of fortune and resist the centrifugal centrifugal forces pulling us away from our lord stay right in the center always keeping a contemplative gaze inside our eyes are fixed on the lord hebrews 12 2 let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us looking to jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith that word, so interesting. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Look, aphoreo, aphoreo uh, is literally to look away. Uh, so it means to fix our eyes, to look away from everything else. It's only used a couple times in the New Testament, twice. Uh, this word is used here in Hebrews 12 too, and I think it's great. This word is so uh, peculiar. It, it means to look but it means to fix one's eyes on something. To look away from all else. They attach that little prepositional prefix on their apple, which means away, and attach it to see. So it means to see away from everything else uh, and to see distinctly fixing our eyes on our Lord. That's what Peter didn't do there. He took his eyes off the Lord. And... Uh, Truly, you are the son of God, they're going to say when he climbs into the boat. Look, only God, Yahweh alone walks on water. Okay, the Lord alone does this. Our Lord here is acting like God. Let's get that nice and clear. As Pope Benedict said, this is a divine theophany, a manifestation of his divinity here. Make no bones about it in this story. Look, only Yahweh walks on water. Job 9, 8. Isaiah 43, 16. Habakkuk 3.15. And only Yahweh stills the storm. Okay? He's the only one that commands the forces of nature like this. Psalm 65.8. Psalm 89.10. Psalm 107.28-30. Only Yahweh saves from drowning. Psalm 18.17. Psalm 144.7. So they get down and worship him and say, Truly you are the Son of God, anticipating Matthew's confession in chapter 16 and a couple more chapters, he says, you are the Christ, the son of a living God, uh, he's going to say to our Lord. So slowly it's coming, dawning on them, but it's like a dimmer switch on the wall. It's going to take some time uh, to get those two things together, divinity and humanity, understand our Lord's true identity. It's going to take some time. Now, immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. John gives us that little detail, chapter 6, verse 21. Immediately the boat was at the land. He gets into the boat, and immediately. I mean, Matthew and Mark say the storm was stilled, or the, the wind stopped when he got in the boat. 
But John says they were immediately at the land to which they were going. This could be an allusion to Psalm 107, verses 29 and 30. Definitely go check this out. But uh, yeah, he made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet and he brought them to their desired haven. Uh, the story of these men who were uh, in desperate straits on the waters. Uh, these sailors. And uh, he brought them to their desired haven. It's cool. All right, now maybe that's what John's evoking. Psalm 107, verses 29 and 30. Go check it out. They did not understand about the loaves because their hearts were hardened. Now, tassels at Gennesaret is how this thing ends. Gennesaret is this piece of land, maybe two miles wide, four miles long. It's at the north western end up there in between Capernaum and Magdala, uh, that end. Okay, there's like a plain. The rest, most pretty much for the most part, there's like hills surrounding the Sea of Galilee. Uh, but there's this one little gap up at the north kind of western end that's like a plain, and it's a very fertile place. Uh, and it's named Kinar after these like trees there, Kinar trees. If you trace out the original Hebrew word, Kinareth, it's referred, the whole sea was referred to as the Sea of Kinareth, okay? Uh, later, this gets Grecanized as, or Hellenized as Gennesaret, okay? But uh, you hear example, references to it in the Old Testament. In Numbers 34, 11, it's referred to as the Sea of Kinareth, or Kinareth, and in Joshua 12, 3, the Sea of Kinneroth, like plural. Um, anyway, so yeah, it's interesting. Um, according to rabbinic, the rabbinic Talmud, it's based on the Kinar trees. And there was a city there by that name in the 14th century BC. Uh, so anyway, a little history about where exactly they're going. That's where they're going. And they land there, the people grab uh, their, uh, his tassel. Okay, we already talked about that, uh, how the people were doing that. His tzitzit, okay, crespedon, okay, this tassel. Um, yeah, based on Numbers 15, 37 and following, go back and read that uh, to refresh yourself on, on that. Uh, yeah, they're grabbing hold of that. Power is coming out of his uh, tassel. So at this point in John's gospel uh, is when he's going to launch into his bread of life discourse. Uh, but next time, chapter 15, until then, God bless you.